In my previous videos, we've gone over the changing doctrine of the times of the end. We've also gone over the changing doctrine on blood transfusions, as well as how the disfellowshipping arrangement came about. In this video, we're going to go over how the governing body became the faithful slave in 2010, the faithful slave who up to that point was previously defined as being comprised of being all of the anointed here on earth, but were being represented by the governing body. Yes, that's right. At one time, the governing body only represented the faithful slave. They weren't the faithful slave. We'll also go over how the governing body went from only one man to multiple men. Since the late 1800s, there have been multiple men who have served as governing body members. The organization has gone from one man, Charles Russell, Joseph Rutherford, then Nathan Knorr, to multiple men serving as the governing body. The faces and names of this body have changed throughout the last 145 years, as has the understanding of who they represent and now are, as well as their role and authority over all witnesses today. So let's find out what those changes have been, how they came about, and what it meant for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and all those that follow the organization, the branch. To start, we have to remember that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is a business that started in Pennsylvania. It started out as a publishing company under Charles Russell and continued as a major publishing corporation with a worldwide distribution. That is, until the organization went mainly digital in the early 2000s. As a business, a corporate entity, they have a board of directors. Charles T. Russell, being the main financial contributor from 1878 up to his death in October of 1916, was the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's president. During his tenure as president, he also became known as the faithful anointed servant and was referred to as Pastor Russell. Upon his death in October of 1916, Joseph Rutherford became the faithful steward once he became the president through a much disputed vote, as you saw in my video of how he took over the organization's business side, the corporate entity. See, back then, according to the corporation's charter or how the corporate entity was set up, no one man was to be in charge. Charles Russell basically didn't want what he had been, one man controlling the organization's direction and policy. But as we learned, Joseph Rutherford ignored that charter as well as Charles T. Russell's will. And as he was an attorney with a very strong personality, he was able to manipulate the brothers and take advantage of their lack of legal knowledge and sheep-like personalities. You'll have to watch the videos for the full details. I'll link those in the description for you. Now, once Joseph Rutherford became the president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract corporate business side, he then became known as the faithful steward as Charles Russell had been. Back then, through Nathan Knorr, if you were the president, like I said, of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, you also became the faithful slave or faithful steward, as they were then known. Now, this is important. Prior to Joseph Rutherford's death in January of 1942, he wanted Hayden Covington to become president. See, Hayden Covington had been legally voted in by all board members of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society as the vice president. But 
As you see here, he was told by Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz that he couldn't be president as he was not anointed. And this is very important to keep in mind. Hayden Covington, the vice president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, who would normally become the president, was told he couldn't be president because he was not anointed. In fact, two years after Nathan Knorr became president, Hayden Covington stepped down as vice president with Fred Franz, who was anointed, taking his place. For several years after that, the role and specific identity of the governing body remained basically undefined, except for Nathan Knorr as the president leading the society, or the organization, or branch, as it's now known. A 1955 organizational handbook stated that the visible governing body has been closely identified with the board of directors of this corporation. Now, the only one that was basically noted at that point was Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz. It was very interesting to me to talk to my mom and dad about Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz as governing body members and elected officers of the corporation. Remember, my mom and dad were in Bethel in the late 50s through the mid 60s. Dad understood that at that time, Nathan Knorr was the president and Fred Franz was the vice president of a corporate business, a corporation. Now, mom, I think because of what has been taught over the last 20 years or so, forgot that the governing body members were also the president, vice president, etc. as you will come to find out in this video. In the 1970 yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses on page 65, it noted that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, which is the organization's legal entity title, it noted that the Watchtower organization was used to plan the activity of Jehovah's Witnesses and provide them with spiritual food. It went on to declare, so really the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses is the board of directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. This is what was stated. However, all witnesses really looked to Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz as the only governing body members up to that time. Mainly Nathan Knorr. Well, at least for my parents and my husband's mom. They felt that way at the time. The December 15th, 1971 Watchtower is where we see the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society use the term governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses as the defined group leading the organization with a series of articles explaining the role of the governing body and their relationship with the Watchtower organization, the corporate entity. Now, this is notable because up to that point, it was Nathan Knorr as the president leading the organization. In the early 1970s, there was a meeting that had to do with the officers of this board, including Raymond Franz, in which they felt that there should be a governing body of men instead of only one man. Now, this is something that Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz disagreed with and disputed. However, because there was a board of elected officers, as well as a vote that all board members would have to legally abide by, Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz lost. And the governing body went from one man to several men. This board of directors basically did what Charles Russell wanted and stated in the original charter, as well as his will that Joseph Rutherford just ignored. 
they put more than one man in charge. So now, after this vote, all of these board members, since they were all anointed, they all had to be, in order to be on the board at all, remember Hayden Covington, became governing body members along with Nathan Knorr. The first governing body was made up of 17 men. And from then on, the governing body, now made up of several men, not just one, was known to all witnesses as those chosen by Jehovah, who administered both organizational policy and provided organizational doctrine for all of Jehovah's people. They represented the faithful slave. The faithful slave being all the anointed here on earth. In 1971, the then Vice President of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, Fred Franz, addressed the annual meeting of the Pennsylvania Corporation in Buckingham, Pennsylvania. This annual event was something that was set up under Charles Russell through the original charter that Joseph Rutherford could not ignore because of legalities. They were required at that time to have an annual meeting of corporate members. At this meeting, Fred Franz stated that the legal corporation of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, or the organization, was used as an agency or a temporary instrument used by the governing body on behalf of the faithful and discreet slave. The faithful and discreet slave that was known as all anointed on earth. I know I repeat this, but it's really important to remember the faithful and discreet slave were known as all of the anointed here on earth. The governing body only represented the slave. In 1972, an article in the November 15th Watchtower under questions from readers, it further reinforced the concept of the governing body. The article said the term referred to an agency that administers policy and provides organizational direction, guidance, and regulation, and was therefore appropriate, fitting, and biblical. In 1976, organizational changes were made by the then governing body of the Watchtower organization, significantly increasing the powers and authority of the governing body over all Jehovah's Witnesses. In 1975, the governing body voted as a board to establish six operating committees to oversee the various administrative requirements of the organization's worldwide activities that formerly had been under the direction of the president, Nathan Knorr. This change took effect on January 1st, 1976, and was noted in the book, Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom otherwise known as the Proclaimer's Book. It's stated on pages 108 through 109 as this being one of the most significant organizational readjustments in the modern day history of Jehovah's Witnesses. The April 15, 1992 issue of the Watchtower carried an article titled Jehovah's Provision the given ones, which drew a parallel between ancient non-Israelites who had been assigned temple duties and witness elders in positions of responsibility immediately under the oversight of the governing body. These new administrators did not need to profess to be anointed. Up until 2000, the directors and officers of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society 
were only members of the governing body per the original charter. In order to be on this board, one had to be of the anointed class. Remember? Then in the January 15, 2001 Watchtower, a special announcement was made that the faithful and discreet slave and its governing body, see, they weren't the same, have been entrusted with interests that are far more important than legal corporate matters. It stated that although the governing body was entrusted with all earthly belongings, this did not prevent the slave class from now allowing qualified men from among the other sheep who were not anointed to care for the administrative duties of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. By doing this, the governing body separated themselves from the legal board of directors. Now this is notable because remember Hayden Covington? He was told by Nathan Knorr and Fred Franz that he could not become the president or be in any executive position as he was not anointed and it was not God's will. So what they did now was a complete flip-flop from that because now they're stating that the other sheep or those who are not anointed could now be president, vice president, and so forth. Since then, members of the governing body have not served as directors of any of the various corporations by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in any executive position. And yes, I said corporations, not just one. And the governing body has delegated such administrative responsibilities to other members that now don't have to be anointed. So why couldn't Hayden Covington become president instead of Nathan Knorr. Anyhow, this body has never had a legal corporate entity since their separation from legal corporate matters. But that's not the only change made in the early 2000s. The faithful and discreet slave, which as I have repeated, was previously defined as comprised of all of the anointed around the earth and was only represented by the governing body. But in September 15, 2010, Watchtower was now referring the governing body as being the faithful and discreet slave only. The domestics, which were prior to that, being known to only being comprised of the great crowd, was now redefined as including all members of the great crowd, as well as now members of the anointed class, because they are no longer part of that faithful and discreet slave class. Just the governing body are so much different from when I was younger. So much has changed just within the last 13 years regarding the governing body. I remember a time you didn't know who the governing body were. They to me were like these holy men who set the policy and direction of the organization. I never knew who all of them were. I only knew a name or two. I didn't even know what they looked like. I remember the first convention that showed a talk given by Stephen Lett in 2011 as a governing body member. He was the first governing body I had ever heard speak before. It was actually the first video at a convention that I had ever seen. Now these men, as the governing body, are not only set on a pedestal, but are well known to all. You see them every month during the updates, the broadcasts, and the multiple talks given at the assemblies and conventions. Publicly, they now say they speak 
on behalf of Jesus. Personally, I think this has backfired because where is Anthony Morris? You know, he wasn't the only one to no longer be on the governing body while alive. As I stated earlier in this video, once appointed as a governing body member, that person is a member for life. But Anthony Morris wasn't the only one to no longer be on the governing body, but removed. We had Raymond Franz, Ewart Chitty, and Leo Greenlees, who were also governing body members that somehow came off the body of members and quietly went away. Now, you can literally see Garrett Loesch, Samuel Hurd, David Splane, as well as some of the others who are getting older they too will have to be replaced someday. We currently have two new governing body members this year in 2023. What happens as they age, like all governing body members have since the inception of this organization? Stephen Lett has stated, we are in the final part of the final last day no doubt, the final part of the final part of that last day. How can they continue to say that as we watch all governing body members age before our eyes? Hopefully, this just gives you more things to think about. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like Algorithms. It helps it go out to more people. And if you really liked it, please subscribe so that you can follow along for more and get notified for any new videos. And as always, take care and thanks for watching.